Jill Collins is the author of the international bestseller, The Simple Path to Wealth, Your Roadmap to Financial Independence and a Rich Free Life. He's also known as the godfather of financial independence, and he's back on the Fire Belgium show to discuss his brand new book, Pathfinders, extraordinary stories of people like you on the quest for financial independence and how to join them. In this episode, we discuss with Jack Collins how to invest in a simple and an effective way that beats most actively managed funds, how to reach financial independence, why not caring about all of this investing, finance, and money stuff can actually be your superpower. So if you don't care about all of this investing thing, listen up. How FU money can help you negotiate with your employer and put you in a better position at work. How Jill Collins actually spent all his money on the most luxurious thing that there is out there. And we talk a lot about Jill Collins' biggest investment mistakes and how you can avoid them. Finally, we cover quite a few of the stories that are shared in his new book, Pathfinders. Fascinating stories from people all around the world, taking control of their finances so that they can live more and give more. Before we start, I wanted to let you know that if you're interested in learning how to invest just the way Jill Collins and I discuss in this episode and how it's described in his Simple Path to Wealth, I highly recommend you check out The Simple Path to Wealth and you get Pathfinders. But also, I highly recommend you check the investing workshop that's on the Fire Belgium website at firebelgium.com forward slash investing workshop, where basically I describe how you can get started investing in a simple and efficient way, building wealth on autopilot, optimized for taxes in Belgium. This is a workshop that's been attended already by thousands of people and it's helped hundreds and hundreds of people get started investing in a better way. And so I invite you to check it out. It's free, it's available on demand and you can check it out on the website. All right, let's go. Well, welcome back, Jill. We're so happy to have you back on the Five Belgium show and the Five Belgium community. Thank you for being here. It's an honor to be here. I'm I'm honored that you invite me back. I remember the first time we did this was in Belgium. We did it live. Oh, that's right. We were in Bruges when you were traveling across Europe, that's right? right? Yeah. Yeah, that's it's been a while. That was 2019 or 2020? 2019, I think. If wow. Memory serves. Yeah, that has been a while. And then we had two more conversations since then, so almost one every year. Yeah. All right. Well, we have to keep the tradition going. <laughs> I, I, I always enjoy our conversations. Jill, you, your new book just came out, Pathfinders, Extraordinary Stories of People Like You on the Quest for Financial Independence and How to Join Them. Thank you for spending the time and effort to write this book. It's amazing. I went through, I would say, 80% of it, and it's got so many inspirational stories and nuggets of wisdom like you always do like you've done in the simple path to wealth and this one it's a gathering of wisdom from a lot of different people and it's really interesting to see the way people experience the simple path basically and how they adapt it to their own situation but before we dive into all the details there i'd love for you to remind everyone what is your simple money philosophy the simple path to wealth and how you would summarize that in a few words so the basic formula is avoid debt or get out of it if you haven't been unfortunate enough to accumulate it. So avoid debt, live on less than you earn, and invest that surplus. And specifically, the Simple Path to Wealth talks about how to invest it. And the short answer is in low-cost, broad-based index funds. Amazing. <laughs> and so it's okay, that simple. It over. It was fun. <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. See you next, see you next year. <laughs> see you next year. <laughs> so it really is that simple, right? I mean, what you tell us in the two books is that we don't need to launch, you know, a multi-million dollar tech startup. We don't need to inherit millions of dollars in euros from our, our parents. All we need is to live below our means even with the regular job and potentially even with the low income, right? Absolutely. I, you know, one of the pet peeves that I've had, one of the things that is irritates me a little bit since I started writing about this stuff back in 2011 is the pushback that, oh, that all sounds great, but it's only for people who have high incomes, who have like high tech jobs or engineers or come from a certain class of people. And nothing could be further from the truth. And I knew that because I would hear from people 
who started from very humble beginnings, a very challenging starting points, sometimes starting from a position of poverty growing up, sometimes from starting in a position of debt. And yet they were walking this path and walking it successfully and becoming wealthy in the process. There's a story in Pathfinders, for instance, from a guy who was a migrant laborer picking fruits as a child, a child laborer in the United States. He's now on his way to being a millionaire. So I like to say Pathfinder, nobody can read Pathfinders and then honestly ever look in the mirror and say to themselves, it can't be done because they'll just read so many stories from people facing significant challenges, including, as we talked about before the show, there's a story in there from a guy, uh, Roman by name in Ukraine. He's following the path while his country is being invaded. So almost no matter what your circumstances, you'll find stories and pathfinders that indicate it can be done. So you'll never be able again to say it can't be done, you, of course, can always say, I choose not to do it. But you will know for sure that this is something that's doable and it's being done by people all over the world. Yeah, yeah. And we can see those stories in the book, and I think it's very clear. Certainly, when people have a high income, it's technically easier, but it's not a guarantee either that they reach financial freedom. But you speak in the book, in, in your book, of an example of one of your friends or colleague who had an extravagant life and couldn't even imagine being able to save money despite the income. Can you tell us a bit about that as well? The, the fact that some people are just making so much, but they still can't, the financial independence is not even an option for some reason? Yeah, absolutely. I've heard so many of these stories about, it, it almost seems that having a large income or coming from comfortable circumstances is more of an obstacle than than starting from a a more difficult situation or what would seem to be. The story you're referring to goes back to the early 90s. I had a friend by the name of Ken, and Ken was in the financial business. And he and I were having lunch together in Chicago, and it was just before Christmas, and he had just gotten his annual bonus. And his annual bonus was $800,000. Back in the early 90s, that was real money. And What we talked about at lunch was Ken explaining to me about how he couldn't make ends meet with a bonus of only $800,000. Now, that probably sounds absurd to most of the people listening. It certainly sounded absurd to me. But when I listened to Ken talk about the lifestyle he'd put together, you know, the houses and the cars and the private education and the trips and, and all of this stuff, Truly, $800,000 was not enough. And so Ken, unless he significantly changes his lifestyle, despite the huge income, is never going to reach financial independence. By the same token, I have a a friend of mine from my school days who's never made more than $40,000 a year, and he is financially independent. It's important to understand that it's not a set amount of money that determines it. It's the amount of money you have and how much you need and how you've constructed your life. So the bigger a life you construct, the more money you're going to need. And it's perfectly possible to construct lives that are are so huge that it's never possible. Yeah, in your book, you refer to them as the tyranny of the must-have. Yes. And I find that's a really good way of putting it. Yeah, when I I talk to people, especially at Chautauquas, and of course you've been to Chautauquas, sometimes people will say to me, well, gee, I would love to be financially independent. That sounds wonderful. You know, how do I do that? And the first thing I say, well, you've got to organize your life so that you're not spending everything that comes your way. And then I start hearing things like, well, that sounds good, but, you know, I, I must have these two new expensive luxury cars and I, and I must live in this neighborhood in this house. And, you know, I must send my kids to the school and I must go to the, this exotic place a couple of times a year for vacation. And, you know, the more must haves you have in your life, the less likely you are to achieve financial independence, unless you make that the key must have you have in your life. Because yes. all of them, no matter what our income, we have to make choices. If you buy 
this car instead of that car, you're making a choice. If you buy the less expensive car, then you have the car plus the money you didn't spend to buy something else. And all I suggest to people is the most important thing for me, my money could buy was my freedom. And so I spent the largest amount of money of my income into purchasing financial assets, which is how you buy your financial freedom. You're getting ahead of the questions that I had in mind. This is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Jane, this resonates so much with me because I basically I discovered financial independence and the movement when I was working in Dubai in a place where people tend, to, well, some people make a lot of money and some others make less. But certainly having a high salary helped me get there. Right. But it started from the fact that I was actually broke at some point. I was in a situation where I was forced to track my finances. And before that, money had never been really a problem. And I think it's because I was put in that situation of having to sleep at a friend's place and borrow money from my little brother and really saying, this is never going to happen again. That really forced me to start putting the numbers together. And then from there, start learning about personal finance. But so it's, it's going into this place of adversity, having something sort of bad happening that puts me on the path to this. If I, ha I don't think like this led to me reaching financial independence in just seven years from starting from zero and everyone around me in Dubai and in the Middle East is making a lot of money and, you know, a lot of people far more than I was and they're still there, you know, that was five years ago and they're still there and doing the work they do. Despite, you know, most of them know my story and they, they know about this, but this, I think it's one, there's, there's two aspects to this. One is I was put in a position where I was forced to start taking control. And the other is, yes, my, my needs, my material needs is something that I was happy to reduce because I was pursuing something far greater, which is financial freedom, which is exactly what you talk about in your book. And so, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's just it's exactly what happened to me, basically. What you're writing about in both books is exactly what's happened to me. So it's really, really cool. And in your book, you also talk about, you see, you talk about investing and we've summarized that at the beginning of, of the conversation, but you also talk about a number of secrets. And one of them is quite interesting. You say that if people don't care about all this money, financial investing stuff, this can actually become their superpower. Can you tell us why that is? For people Absolutely. who don't care, how that becomes something positive? One day when my daughter was still in college, she came home to visit. And I had managed to turn my daughter off to all things financial because I pushed it too hard and, and too early. And so she came home from college. And because I think, and I know this stuff is so important, because if you get money right, your life becomes much better. And you have far more options. So obviously I wanted that for my daughter. So I started it again and, and she stopped me and she said, you know, dad, I get it. I know this stuff is important. I just don't want to have to think about it all the time. And a light bulb went off for me. That was an epiphany because I suddenly realized that, you know, you and I, Sebastian, and probably a lot of the people listening to us, we're the odd ones out you know, that we're interested in this stuff. Most people, like my daughter, realize that it's important, but they have other things to do with their life. And so that's really who I, I write for, because the beauty of the simple path to wealth is you don't have to obsess about your investments. You just have to understand a few key things and then make a couple of key decisions and hopefully automate your investments so that you're diverting money from your income every month. And then the less you do, the better. Successful investing is the only thing I can think of in life where the less effort, once you get those simple basics done, the less effort, the better your results. Because the more people tinker with their investments, the worse they tend to do. So the superpower you were referencing is that my daughter now understands these basic concepts. She's set up, she's investing every month in VTSAX. And because she doesn't really care about it, other than the benefit it will bring her, she's not paying attention to it all the time. And because she's not paying attention to it all the time, when the market drops and everybody else is in a big panic and then they're tempted to tinker, well, she's not because she's not even going to notice that it happened. 
And so she's going to stay the course for, for the decades. And that's the result. So people who are in love with this stuff are always tempted to tinker. They're always paying attention. They're always going to be subject to the, to the words of panic around them when the market takes one of its drops. And of course, market drops are a perfectly normal part of the process. Nobody should panic about those things. But they do. And the media goes nuts with you know all this scary stuff. Well, she's not listening to that kind of stuff. Those of us who like this stuff, we are. So that's your superpower. So it's it's like saying, for people who really understand index investing and they really dive deep and they get super involved, they understand that the key is to stay the course. But at the same time, they're so into it that it can be challenging to actually do it. And that maybe another way of staying the course is to just not know anything about it so that we just simply contribute to the investment in the long term and don't touch it even in the case of a financial crash. The simple basic stuff you need to know, which yes. is all the simple path to wealth, and then set it up and let it run. Let it do its thing. Let it make you wealthy. Jack Bogle, who, of course, was the guy who created index funds, and he's the founder of Vanguard. He's since passed away. He was once quoted as saying, you know, and this is back in the old days before computers when people got paper statements. And they'd get their monthly statements in the mail about their investments. He said his recommendation was take those monthly statements, don't even open the envelopes, just mm -hmm. set them aside and forget about them. And then 20 years from now, finally open the most recent envelope you get and have a cardiologist standing by because you will be shocked at what it has grown to. But if you're watching it all the time and you're tinkering with it because you're watching it all the time, you are going to get a less positive result. So I'm willing to bet that my daughter, who's going to pretty much follow Jack Bogle's advice, 20 years from now will outperform almost anybody listening to us who's into this stuff and is trying to fine-tune, <laughs> trying to time the market even a little bit. That's the superpower. Yeah, that's quite amazing. It's an interesting take. It's something quite new, I think. I think you speak from experience when you say that Tinkering and trying to time the market is not necessarily effective and it doesn't always work. In the book, you share a couple of your investment mistakes from back in the days before all of this. Could you share them with us here? Well, I've made so many of them and I don't remember exactly which ones I shared in the book. <laughs> I'll, I'll explain the first one and then I'll let you talk about the second one. The first one you share in the book is when you said that you were slow to embrace index investing yeah. because it's hard to acknowledge that index investing actually works when we are stock pickers. And I don't have that experience, but I can imagine basically everyone who's currently involved in active investing, they have this hate for index investing. Despite all the evidence, they still don't embrace it. What does it take for someone to finally say, all right, okay, I get it now. I've spent all this time and all, you know, sometimes I've lost money. It's time to move to index investing. What's, how was that for you? And what do you think is necessary for people to have that, that change? No question, that's my single biggest financial mistake is it took me way too long to embrace index investing. So the irony is I, I started investing in 1975, and that coincidentally was the year that Jack Bogle created the first index fund. And I frequently think to myself, had I known that, and had I been wise enough to embrace it then, I would be far wealthier today, and my path would have been far easier, far simpler, frankly. But I didn't know that. In fact, I didn't hear about index index investing for another decade. So it wasn't until about 1985 that I first heard about the idea of index investing from a college friend of mine who had become a financial guy, and he was telling me about the advantages of this kind of investing. But even then, because I was a stock picker and I was reasonably good at it. In fact, I achieved financial independence picking stocks and picking <laughs> the actively managed mutual funds that were run by stock pickers, right? So what made it so hard for me, and I think makes it hard for a lot of people that are kind of into this stuff, and especially if you've had some success picking stocks, is that it just seems so counterintuitive. You know, index investing basically says you buy everything in the index. 
So in VTSAX, which is the index fund I own, that owns every publicly traded company in the United States, right? So it just seems so obvious that, well, if I'm picking stocks, if I just avoid the bad ones, I'm going to outperform, right? Or if I just focus on on the ones that are winning, I'm going to outperform. And that just, I couldn't get past that. But the research is mm-hmm. clear that it's not that simple. And very few people can do that. I think the, you know, in, in any given year, maybe 25% of active managers outperform the index in that year. And then the more years you stack on top of it, the lower that percentage drops till by the time you're out 30 years, it's less than 1% that could outperform the index over time. But that's very hard to wrap your head around because it just seems like it should be so easy. So when I hear people arguing against indexing now, I hear my own voice in my head because I made those arguments back in the day. So that kept me for an embarrassing long time from finally realizing the you know how superior indexing is. And and eventually I got there and then I'll give myself credit that I kept looking at it. You know, I didn't just dismiss yeah. it and go on. I kept I kept looking at it, but It took me a long time for it to sink in. And to be clear, part of the problem is that it's not like being a stock picker is bad or doesn't work, right? It does, or it can, if if you're reasonably good at it. It's just that being an index investor works better and it works with a whole lot less effort. And so speaking just for myself, if I can get better results with less effort, that's kind of a no-brainer. <laughs> That's why it's also called lazy investing often, which is not always, yeah, it's an interesting terminology. It's actually a very efficient way of investing because it takes yes. very little time and it optimizes for the returns we get for time spent on it. And also the odds are in our favor in, in most of those scenarios. But but thanks for sharing your, the story with us. I mean, the fact that you're willing to go back into those <laughs> stories to teach the lesson, I think it's it's really valuable. It helps a lot of people. And, you know, stock pickers can probably learn a lot from from your realizations and from your experience going through that. So that's, that's really, really good. And you also mentioned another one that is equally important, <laughs> and that, that it was your experience with the stock market crash. I think you were still a stock picker where it didn't go so well. <laughs> right. Uh, so I think what you're referring to there is what came to be known as Black Monday. Yeah. That was in 1987. And you were right. Those were, I was still a stock picker in those days. And, and this is, of course, before, you know, the internet and, and computers were still even relatively new in business and what have you. And I still had a stockbroker. Some people listening might not even know what a stockbroker was, but it was an individual through whom for very high commissions, you bought individual stocks. And on this particular Monday, I'd been working, it'd been a busy day. And, and, you know, again, you're not, you don't have your computer in front of you where you can see how the stock market is doing all the time. So I just didn't know. And I called Wayne, just, I don't even know why I called him. I mean, Wayne being my broker and it's the end of the day and he answers the phone and I said, Hey, how you doing? And <laughs> he said, you're kidding, right? And I could tell he was distressed by the tone of his voice. And I said, you know, what's going on? And he said, the market just had its worst single day drop in history, percentage wise. It went down, I want to say 23, 25%, something like that in one day. I mean, that's worse than anything that happened in the Great Depression. It's worse than anything that has happened since. It was a stunningly bad day. And of course, his customers have been calling him in great panic and, you know, and it had been obviously a very difficult day to be a, be a stockbroker. But at that point, I knew what you were supposed to do, which is nothing, is to stay the course that the market would recover. And initially I did. But then after that big one day crash, it started just grinding down more and more. And of course, you know, that one day crash again, took it down by 25%. So as it ground down lower and lower, you know, the the losses got bigger and bigger. And I don't know, after about three months, probably in, this was in September, I want to say, and 
probably in December, I, I finally lost my nerve and I, and I sold out. And of course, if I didn't sell out at the exact bottom, it was close enough that it really didn't matter. And the market, of course, began to turn around. And by the time uh, a year later, or by the following September, September, it had not only completely recovered, it had surpassed where it had been before it had crashed while I had sat on the sidelines. And so when I finally bought in, I was buying in at higher prices. That taught me to always stay the course, to never fall prey to the panic all around you. And there was a lot of panic around me. And sometimes I, I wonder, can people listen to me say that or read what I write about that and not avoid the panic? Or do, do people have to go through a market plunge and panic themselves and then feel the pain of watching the market turn around and move up without them before that lesson sinks in? I hope people can hear me say it or read what I have to say about it and not have to live through it. But turns out I had to live through it. But then I didn't have a book called The Simple Path to Wealth to refer to either. Yeah. And I mean, obviously, you are speaking about the time where all of this information wasn't readily available. The philosophy of buying and holding wasn't the main philosophy that was, you know, explained as being the winning one. There wasn't all this research proving that holding long term index funds was the key to winning. I mean, it was, it was just nascent. And most people thought it was crazy. So, <laughs> I mean, it was it was a very different time, different information, yeah. different resources, and so, and still today, this like we're talking about, you know, decades of research and understanding and report and statistics and all, all of that. Still today, most people who go through stock market crashes behave exactly like that. Right? We see all the data of well, the the two crashes in the in the two thousands. Most of the outflow is at the bottom of the market, and most of the inflow is at the top. Right. So most people sell low and buy high. And it's just, it feels like it's just despite knowing, right? People know it's going to recover. It's just, there's, there's something about human psychology that makes it happen. It's just, I, I mean, it must be really difficult. Now I'm, sp I'm saying this, it must be very difficult because most of us in this room, aside from you, we have not gone through any market crash of that kind of magnitude, right? What happened with COVID? was almost a joke. Uh, 2022 is nothing compared to what happened before, <laughs> you know, 15 years ago and beyond, right? And so we haven't had that direct experience. And all we can do is really listen to people who have gone through it. So that's that's you and the investors that have been in the game for 20 plus years, at least, who can tell us like how, what it takes to get through it. And obviously, you know, I resonate with you here. We certainly hope that learning from your experience will help us stay the course when stuff happens here. But and I, hopefully we have a better, bit of a better environment, support system, voices, you know, like yours that will help us go through that time. Yeah, I think it's important for people to understand that market drops are normal. They're a perfectly normal part of the process. So when the market drops 10%, which is considered a, a correction, and that happens on a pretty frequent basis, or 20%, which is a bear market, which is not quite as frequent, but not uncommon, or even crashes uh, that are 30, 40, 50%, that's all normal. Crashes, of course, being much rarer. I think I read recently that one occurs every 10, 13 years, something like that. But it's normal. It's like hurricanes or blizzards, depending on where you live, you know, big, scary, dangerous things, but normal. And, you know, as long as you don't run out into the middle of the hurricane or the blizzard, you're going to be fine. As long as you don't panic and sell, and you let the storm pass and the market crashes, you'll be fine. And just remind yourself that it's perfectly normal. And you mentioned the the upside of today where there's so much research and information that confirms what I'm saying and, you know, my books and, and others that confirm it. But the other side of that is there's so much more media now that when the market crashes and people are panicking, that panic is much more pervasive. It's everywhere. And you're going to be hearing it all the time. And you just have to tune it out and stay the course. And that can be very difficult. 
But the thing to remember is these things are normal. That volatility is the price we have to pay for the large long-term building of wealth that stocks can provide. Yeah, I, I love that part of this is the price we have to pay to benefit from the stock market. And I think Morgan Hauser puts it in his book as well. He says, the real cost to invest in the stock market isn't the transaction fee or the total expense ratio of an index fund. That's not the real cost. The real cost is the emotional cost that it takes to go through the ups and downs and the roller coaster and be able to stay the course and the, the emotion impact it can have. And then our reaction, and sometimes, you know, a reaction that leads to losses if we panic sell. And if you refer to this as the real cost, and you refer to it as, as the cost, as the price as well to investing in your book. And I think that's that's the best way to basically help people understand what they're getting into, right? When they sign up for index investing, the cost of investing isn't how much it costs you to trade in and out. Because obviously, you know, in Belgium, we have to go through the stock market and ETF. So we have some cost of transaction. And it's not just the cost of running the fund through uh, the fund manager. It's it's mostly the cost of having to go through that that difficult time. Obviously, you've gone through that. So you've 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 experienced the cost and run, run through it multiple times since since 1975. But yeah, there's different kinds of costs, you know, the 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 fees and, and what have you are the financial costs, but the emotional cost can wind up costing you much more money if you succumb to it. I tell people, if you are not absolutely sure that when the market drops and it will drop, it's not a matter of if, but it will definitely drop. If you're not absolutely sure that you will stay the course and not panic, you don't want to follow my advice. Because if you panic and sell during those drops, my advice will leave you bleeding by the side of the road. If you're going to panic and sell when the market drops, you shouldn't be investing in stocks. And by the way, that's okay. Because I do understand that it can be terrifying when it happens. And if you look in the mirror and you're honest or honest with yourself and you say you know if i woke up tomorrow and my portfolio was down 40 percent I, I that would that would destroy me that would be you know that would well then you shouldn't be in stocks you have to know that that's a po always a possibility and you have to be willing to accept that and willing to stay the course through it if you're not absolutely sure you can do that or you're not comfortable with the idea of doing that, then as powerful wealth building tool as stocks are, there's that's not going to work for you. It only works if you stay the course of those crashes. And moreover, not only should you realize that they're normal, but you should realize if anything, they are a wonderful way to build your wealth. Because whether or not stocks make you wealthy is going to be dependent on what you do when they drop. If you panic and sell, they're going to leave you poor, bleeding by the side of the road. If you stay the course or even better, shift money, more money into them while they're on sale, then over time they will make you wealthy. But these are things to think about and decide for yourself while the market's calm like it is today. These are not things to try to figure out in the middle of a panic. Absolutely. And that's also where planning for what money to invest and asset allocation, how much to allocate to bonds and the role you can have in a balanced portfolio, that will help you then be more ready for when that happens, right? It's certainly part of strategy. JL, this is amazing. So much wisdom. <laughs> uh, I really appreciate your time here again. Um, on, in your book, you have hundreds of amazing stories and I've gone through a lot and there's actually, I've bookmarked four or five of them. There's, there's three that really stood out to me. One that you ref referred to earlier, which is the story of Roman from Ukraine. Yeah. I don't know if you remember all the stories. I'm, that, <laughs> so I'm putting you on the spot here. I remember that one. I may not remember them all, but I remember, yeah. Uh, so he lives obviously in a place that's now at war and under a lot of pressure. And it's really, really complicated. And in his, in his story, he actually shares really good I mean, basically reading the stories of people who go through hardship and are in these situations that are more difficult highlights how much 
the wisdom that we we keep hearing about is actually really really important because those situations could happen to us too in other basically different but they're going through situations that basically make those that, that wisdom really practical and, and useful right away and one of them for him is diversification it's not just a fancy word right so he's explaining how part of his capital is frozen there's because he had money invested in ukrainian bonds and those are now blocked because of the war and there's there's a need for financing and so that that's one another one is disaster can happen insurance and backup plans can only protect you so much when they do so you have to have cash and liquid assets because they're the ultimate curveball of life so it's really planning for the worst and then having even more safety right so in it, it really it really like materializes and makes those you know those this is the wisdom that we hear but he's really living through it and i think there's something really powerful in being able to read those stories and then we have the story that's just next to it is the story of Artem who lives in Russia and who experiences obviously the same situation but from the other side and who's applying the simple path to wealth in his situation. And again, there he's he's doing it in his context that's completely different. Russia being isolated financially from the rest of the world and so also seeing the impact of diversification, having assets abroad and all this being frozen and then having to live in a country where the money is losing value, inflation is, is is skyrocketing, and still going through a simple path because even in those situations, it works, right? It's still like the foundations are, they work in even the, the worst economies and even in countries at war, right? And this is kind of what I, I got from this. And it, well, it's amazing you're having an impact even there. I don't know if there's something you want to share about those two stories, um, I, you did say that you spoke to the to the guy in Ukraine recently. Yeah, Roman, Roman has a podcast. So uh, yesterday, the day before, I'm forgetting at this point, but I was on his podcast. So we had a fairly lengthy conversation. And it is, it's an amazing, it's an amazing story. And it, for me, it drives home the fact that, as you already alluded to, that you can follow this path in, in the worst of circumstances knowing that at some point these two will pass, right? And things will get better. And really the only thing any of us can do is just try to keep moving forward. And we don't get to live a life with no risk. We don't get to invest with no risk. We only get in the investment world to choose what kind of risks you want to take. If you choose stocks, you choose the risk of, vol of volatility. You know, in life, which of course is going to impact your investments, if your country gets invaded, then that's going to impact your, your investments as it has with Roman. But the good news is, because he was following a simple path to wealth, he has some assets outside the Ukraine. The other potentially good news is when this war is over, his Ukrainian stocks and bonds that have been frozen because of the war effort will be unfrozen and, and he'll be able to access that value. Uh, for Artem in Russia, you know, I mean, Russia's crippled economically because of the sanctions the world has put on them because of their invasion. And obviously that's hurting innocent people like Artem, but he still managed to shift some of his money out of the country. And those are the kinds of stories that I really find inspirational, particularly because here in America, when I'm talking to people, you know, the kinds of complaints I hear about following the simple path to wealth is, oh, well, gee, if I do that, I can't buy this fancy car I want. <laughs> and I, you know, I want to slap my head and say, you know, I'm sorry. It's very hard for me to be sympathetic to that excuse when I know people now like Artem and, and Roman and, and the the migrant laborer that I was referring to earlier, or the other story of, uh, I forget who this was, but they said, you know, when I was growing up, the rich people had a toilet. You know, well, okay, you know, if these people can figure out a way to do it, and a fancy car is keeping you from doing it, then, you know, I don't know how, what what I can really say. 
And that's why I said earlier in our conversation that if, you know, that there's a danger in reading The Simple Path to Wealth. And the danger is that you can never again honestly say it can't be done. <laughs> and in some ways, I've I've come to think of the Pathfinders is probably the better book of my two to introduce people to the FI mm -hmm. world, because it is, again, a hundred stories from all around the world, all different. There are, there are stories, by the way, of people with high paying jobs in Pathfinders too, who mm -hmm. are doing, doing it well. So from all over the world, all different circumstances, all different stages of their life who are doing it. And I think and along with my commentary about, you know, what the path looks like. I think if you read that book and and it inspires you to say, wow, I, this could be part of my life, then the simple path to wealth is the how-to manual. You know, it, it will tell you exactly what this path looks like and how you can follow it. So I could not have written Pathfinders without first writing the simple path to wealth, obviously, because I wouldn't have heard all these stories if I had. <laughs> but I think now for someone who is coming to this new or for somebody listening who wants to, you know, gives a book to somebody that they want to encourage down this path. I almost think Pathfinders is, is probably the better introductory book, but yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, another reason for, for why that is the case is because the book is divided into nine parts and in each part, you really tackle one specific aspect or issue or, or step sort of on the simple path. First one being freedom. So that's talking about the main concept of financial freedom. And then you tackle debt, right? Which is often a place people say, yes, but I'm in debt. How can I even think about all this? And then you talk about saving, which is sort of the solution to debt, but also the engine to everything else to get to fun. Then you speak about lifestyle inflation, investing of course which is sort of the way we put all of that to work a few money which is an extremely important concept and I, I love the stories you share there i love how you talk about the power of freedom at the very beginning of the journey and how we can help shift the power and specifically in your story about you and your employer and how the power got shifted when when you had some a few money that's probably something you could share with us i think this is I mean, it's a fascinating story and something really illustrates the power of just knowing about this and getting started because the benefits are right there from the start. And that's amazing. Would, would you mind telling us a bit uh, how, how that went for you? Well, I'll, I'll tell you that story, but I, but I want to make a comment before I do. The then I think people find this a little bit interesting. When when I decided to do this book and Harriman House, my, my publisher and I were talking about it and specifically Chris Parker, who is my editor, I, I, on my social media and on my blog, I, I put out a call and asked people to send in their stories. And of course, we didn't know for sure if people would or if we would get enough stories for a book or if the stories would be interesting enough or high quality enough to you know, but it turns out we, we got a lot of stories and we had to sift through them to pick out the, the hundred best. But we didn't have that that nine, those nine uh, categories in our head. The stories define those as they came in, right? So we're 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 going through these stories and reading them and and thinking about them. And and as you as I'm sure you would agree, you know, you can find story a you know, story in under the lifestyle or life style inflation section that could also fit under other ones. So we had to make some calls as to where to put specific stories. But the stories themselves kind of dictated what the organization of the book was going to look like, which I think is pretty cool. And it's amazing you got stories at all stages. Which yes. Is really, really cool. Yeah. And then, yeah, that's the other thing. Thank you for that. Because then, you know, when we said, oh, okay, there's, there's stories about how people de dealt with debt. And there are stories about how they dealt with lifestyle inflation and their stories about investing and there. And then so suddenly we had these groupings, these nine different groupings of stories. And we realized, you know what? There's also a sequential pattern to these, right? Starting with freedom as you as you walk through. So I won't do it, but freedom. And then if you have debt getting out of it. And then, you know, the savings rate, which frees up the capital, and then lifestyle inflation, which can be a destroyer of of your wealth and you know 
so it it just it was kind of amazing how the book came together mm -hmm. and i yeah i'm i'm thrilled with it and i'm proud of it and yeah and I, you should be <laughs> very, i'm very grateful to all the people who shared their stories and you have an amazing community i mean that you know people are really, really do take the time and and write and probably rewrite and improve based on feedback and this and that it's it's really really amazing uh, i mean yeah it's, it's really cool and and they're so insightful as i was saying yeah? if you can live if you can read while putting yourself in their shoes it gives you perspective and yeah what you shared there you know the fact that if they can do it then what are my reasons not to do it <laughs> and I, oh related to that there's something that you shared in the book that's really interesting and it was at the very beginning of your journey when you were being paid a certain amount and you decide to save 50 percent of your income which is obviously a huge number for most people but what i love is the way you looked at it and you said well gee i'm i'm making i think it was five thousand dollars a year was that is that right i was making ten thousand a year ten thousand a year sorry yes and you were saying well there's some people living on five thousand a year why can't i and i think that frame of saying, well, you know, there's, there's people who can live on that amount of money. Why not me? Like, it just removes all of the excuses and the must-haves almost that that people are kind of, well, they, 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 they grow into with lifestyle inflation and all this, no? But I think that's an interesting frame because, say, in Belgium, there are people who live very happily on 1,500 euro a month, right? But a lot of people who are making 3,000, they can barely save 300. So, well, you know, <laughs> one way of looking at it is, well, if they can live on 1,500, why can't I? Right? And then from there, I think you can dive into, okay, what, what can I change to get there? Or maybe not to get there, but at least to improve a little bit. Uh, no, it's it's really good wisdoms there and really helpful tools as well. Yeah. No, I agree. I, I When I first came out of college, it was in the 70s and it, it, it was a bad economic time. It took me two years to get my first prof professional job out of school. And, but I, and I was making $10,000 a year. And I think that's, if you adjust for inflation, about $50,000 in today's money, something like that. But when I was in college, I, I you know, I, I, I was very poor. I was paying myself, putting myself to school. I didn't have anything. So the idea of living on five thousand dollars, half my ten thousand a year, that was a huge step up for me as well as you know. So I did look around. I said, you know, a lot of people live on five thousand dollars a year. There's no reason I can't do it. And plus, you know, I've been living on much less. I lived on much less in that two-year gap as I was trying to find a job because I, you know, I was like scraping together odd jobs to to pay the bills. So it wasn't. It wasn't difficult. I think in some ways it's more difficult to unwind a lifestyle that you've created than than you know never falling into that into that yeah. to begin with. And I think it you know you're saying it wasn't difficult, but it's because you were in a situation that was challenging to begin with, right? Mm -hmm. it's difficult times, can't find a job, so yeah, making, ends meet, <laughs> making ends meet was a challenge for two years, which makes money important because it's scarce. And I think going through that period, it's like I've had that that experience. No, I've gone through a period where money was scarce, and that's what put me on the path. <laughs> that's how I discovered your blog, right? <laughs> 2011, 2012. I was like, I need to take care of my finances, and then bam, you know, <laughs> your website came up. And I think there's something about being in in this situation of difficulty that puts us then on a positive path, which seems to have been the case for you too. Yeah. yeah, the other thing that, that bothers me a little bit is this idea, well, you know, this is such deprivation and I want to enjoy my life. And no question, I mean, having money and, you know, creates opportunities and, and you know, it expands maybe the way you can enjoy your life. But I've enjoyed all the phases of my life. And in fact, when I think back over it, probably if I could choose to relive a time in my life, it would be college. And that's when I was the absolute poorest. I had the absolute least amount of money, but it was a great life because, you know, I, I, college was interesting work and I was surrounded by interesting people and there was a lot of free time and, and, and nobody had a lot of money. So, you know, this idea that you have to have spend money to be happy is just, 
I think a false narrative. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly spending money can be an advantage and, and I'm not opposed to that, but uh, the idea that no, I, I can't organize my life to live on less because I want to enjoy my life. That's just seems to me to be faulty reasoning. Yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, happiness doesn't have to cost much money. And <laughs> exactly what you said just there. JL, thank you so much. Thanks for, for your time and your wisdom. We have a few questions from the audience. They've been sending them through Slido here. And we have quite a lot. But given the time we have left, I will start from the top, those that have been most devoted. And we'll see if we can get to five. It depends on you know how complex they are. <laughs> I see that my question is number six. So we'll try to get the first five. And uh, the question I asked, so we'll see if it gets supported <laughs> in the meantime. <laughs> but let's start. This is a question from Pascal. Pascal is saying at 63, my goal is to protect savings against inflation, which asset allocation and investing time frame, all savings at once or spread in time. So yeah, whether to go all in or to DCA over time would you recommend? So that's multiple questions here. It's like, basically, how would you protect against inflation with your asset allocation? And how would you start investing if you have a lump sum at 63? So starting with inflation, you have to think of it, I think, in two ways. So if you're talking about hyperinflation, uh, the kind of thing that happened in Germany, for instance, in the 1920s or in Zimbabwe or in Venezuela, that absolutely decimates a country, and there's really nothing that can protect you from that. Fortunately, most kinds of inflation are not that. And the kind of inflation that you're experiencing in Europe at the moment that we're experiencing in the United States, actually stocks do better in times of that kind of inflation than anything else. So. The problem with inflation, you know, and now I'm talking about, you know, inflation that's 5, 10, even 20% inflation, that's good for, for stocks because companies have assets and they have pricing power. And so their value will grow along with that inflation. The people who really get hurt with that kind of inflation are poorer people or people who are living paycheck to paycheck and just spending their money and not investing it. So stocks are probably the best inflation edge you, you can have. Again, short of hyperinflation, which is just destroys everything in its path. I think the second part of the question, if I understand it correctly, is this person has a lump sum of money in cash and wants to know how to deploy it, whether to invest it all at once or to dollar cost average it in i'm an advocate of investing it all all at once and here's the reason so let's suppose that it's 120,000 euros just sake of argument and you decide to dollar cost invest it over a year so you're going to put 10,000 euros in every month and the reason you're doing that is because you're afraid that if you put it all in today Tomorrow will be the day you wake up and the market's down 40%. So if you're putting it 10,000 a month and you wake up tomorrow and it's down 40%, well, that's going to be bad for that 10,000. But then you're buying, you know, you're buying at lower levels and that'd be a good thing. So that's the appeal of dollar cost averaging. The reason I don't like it is because the market on average goes up 75% of the time, goes down 25% of the time. So when you are dollar cost averaging, you are betting that it's going to go down that 25% of the time. Now, if I have a wager put in front of me and one side is a 75% chance of winning and the other is a 25% chance of winning, I'm going to choose a 75% chance, right? For obvious reasons. Because if you dollar cost average and the market doesn't go down during that period of time, you will lose. Even if the market stays flat, you'll lose because you will have been delaying putting your money to work, right? And certainly if the market goes up, you will lose because every month you, your 10,000 euros will be buying fewer shares. So the only way you win is if the market goes down, that only happens 25% of the time. So that's the rationale behind investing in a lump sum. But here's the kicker. Remember, why are you, why is dollar cost averaging appealing? Well, because 
you don't want to put it all in today, wake up tomorrow and the market's down 40%. But dollar cost averaging doesn't save you from that risk. I mean, who's to say that you don't put it in in 10,000 euro chunks over the course of a year and the day after you invest that last chunk is the day that it drops 40%. So you really haven't mitigated that, that risk at all. And in fact, I'll take it a step further. Whenever you are invested in the stock market, you always have that risk. You and I are invested in the stock market. So tomorrow we could wake up and it could be down 40%, as we talked about earlier. That's the price you have to pay. That's normal. Right. So it doesn't matter whether you're investing that money today and it happens or you've been investing it for 20 years and that happens. That's always looming in the background. And someday it will absolutely happen because, as we talked about earlier, stock market crashes are normal. They're a normal part of the process. Yeah. And, in, and investing is accepting that it's going to happen at some point. It's the price of investing. It's the price you pay for the long term wealth building power and in terms of, in terms of asset allocation what would you tell pascal who's 63 now well that's a much more personal thing right and i don't know if pascal is still working or not so if you are still working this is more whether you're working or not rather than age in my world so if you're working and you are diverting part of your income into buying investments then that's what allows you to take advantage of those market drops right? Because then whatever you're putting in each month buys more shares when the market goes down. If you're living on the portfolio, you probably want something to smooth the ride in the way your earned income did before. And bonds play that role. So in terms of how much in stocks and bonds you should have, that really depends on how important smoothing that ride is to you as opposed to long-term gains. So you, you, it's a personal decision, but what you want to think about is the more stock you have, the rougher the ride will be, the more volatility you'll have to endure, as we talked about. The more bonds you have, the less of that you'll have to endure, the smoother the ride will be. But the more stock you have, the more growth you'll have, and the greater your returns will be over the long term. The more bonds you have, the less growth you'll have and the lower those returns will be. So it's a trade-off and only the individual can decide what that trade-off is worth. I'll leave one last caveat on that. You don't ever, in my opinion, want to have less than 50% stocks because without the growth potential of stocks, your portfolio is unlikely to last for the long term because bonds slowly erode in value uh, to inflation. Amazing. Thank you. The next most voted question, there's two, actually, they're equal, <laughs> uh, but we'll go with the most interesting. How would you convince someone, either your daughter or a partner, to join the simple path? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, I, there's only, I, I like to say I've only ever tried to convince one person, and that was my daughter. And as I say, I pushed her too hard, too fast and managed to turn her off. Now, I'm grateful to say that as a young adult, she's come around and she is firmly on the simple path. But I don't actually try to convince anybody. I'm not interested in arguing with people. You know, if if somebody reads The Simple Path to Wealth and it resonates with them and they benefit from it, and I hear from people all the time that tell me it's changed their life, I think that's wonderful. But uh, you know, occasionally I'll get people who say, well, you know, this guy wrote this book and or this article and, and he disagrees with you. Tell me why he's wrong. Well, I'm, I'm not going to do that. I mean, I'm going to say, read what I've written and then you will know what my ideas are and then read what that person has written and you will know what their ideas are and then you choose. <laughs> now, for somebody who has family members or friends and, and they want to help them become comfortable with it. Again, as we said earlier, I think Pathfinders is actually the better introductory book because in Pathfinders, they're going to read a hundred stories from a huge range of different people all over the world who are doing it. And they're talking about what it's meant to them and why they're doing it and how it's made their lives better. 
And I can't think of anything more persuasive than that. Perfect. So yes, I agree with that. <laughs> Actually, the more those people hear about the stories of people on the path, then the easier it is for them to imagine them benefiting from it too, right? So talking about the benefits and the fact that so many people are doing it. Yeah, yeah that's really, really helpful. We have a question from Thomas and he's asking, you've shared how you would invest generally, but would anything be different for someone who's 45 years old? specifically, because I guess that's his age. So again, it kind of, this kind of relates to the uh, question we had a moment ago. That was an asset allocation question, right? Yeah, he's specifically asking what advice would you have for someone who just started at 45, like started investing at 45. Right. So assuming that Thomas is working yeah, and he's got cash flow from his earned income, then that's what smooths the ride and stocks are the most powerful way to build wealth. So I would be a hundred percent in a broad based low cost index stock fund for somebody who is living on their portfolio as the other fellow I think was, then you might want to add bonds to smooth the ride. Or if you are somebody for whom the volatility is really going to bother you and you're willing to give up some growth to smooth the ride, then you might want to add bonds to the degree that that volatility bothers you. Again, remembering that if you start dropping below 50% in stocks, you know, you're, you're, you're not going to have a successful long-term portfolio. So it's, to me, it's not so much a function of age. It's a function of your work status, whether you're retired or not. And of course, in the FI community, you know, we know people who are re retired at 30. And then there are people like me in their 70s who are still writing books and working. <laughs> um, awesome. Thank you. We have two more questions. One is someone who's anonymously asking, I am 37 and I've been saving for a house since I was 30. I have 60,000 euros now and thinking of investing in index funds instead of buying a house, I guess, should I take the leap? So it's a little hard for me to talk about because I'm not familiar with the European housing market. But in the US, I would say it depends on, and I think this might apply uh, to Europe, it depends on what your goals are. So if your goals are to, are to maximize your wealth, you are probably going to be better off in the index fund because index funds over time outperform real estate. Houses to me are an expensive indulgence. Houses are not an investment. I've owned houses for most of my adult life, so I'm not against expensive indulgences, but I don't think of them as investments. And I've only bought them. Uh, I've only bought houses that I could buy comfortably from what I call a position of strength. I never a stretched to buy one where it was difficult to make the mortgage payments. Uh, uh, so if there's a house that is going to make your life better and you're willing to spend your money on that and you don't overextend yourself to do it, then by all means. But if what you really want to do is maximize building your wealth and you know you will stay the course over time, then, then index funds, stock index funds are your better bet. Thank you. And then let's let's say this is the next question. We'll see if we'll do one more after that. This is a question from, Th Tho, I guess it's Thomas. I'm not sure. Um, 27 year old. I don't feel ready to work for 15 years straight. And I don't want to wait living until I'm in my 40s. What advice do you have on making this path as pleasant as possible? So it kind of sounds like like Thomas and I are similar in in the sense that when I was starting out, I, I liked working. I liked my career. I just didn't like to have to do it all the time. And so by saving and investing and building what I came to think of as my FU money, it allowed me to periodically take sabbaticals between jobs. So I, you know, I, I like, as I said a moment ago, I'm in a sense, I'm still working and I'm in my seventies because I like working, but I also liked to be able to step away anytime I wanted to. And by building up my FU money, I was able to do that. 
and then after I took a break, and I think the shortest I ever did was three months, and the longest was five years. Uh, you know, then I go back to work, and I'd feel more excited about going back to work and more energized, and and it would be fun again. So that's how I handled it, and and I think that's what I hear him asking. Yeah, I think that's certainly a potential solution. I think a lot of people see the financial independence journey as something that they have to just rush and get to as fast as possible. But I hear from what you're saying, that's not necessarily the only way. Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. You We talked about my 50% savings rate, which was, you know, again, remember this is 1975. I, there was no FI community out there talking about this stuff. So I just kind of pulled that number out of the air. I mean, randomly, I thought I knew I wanted it to be big because, you know, buying my freedom was the most important thing I could do with my money. Well, since then, you know, I, I get pushback from both directions. You know, I, I get pushback from people who say 50%. Are you insane? Nobody can save 50% of their income. Well, I'm sorry. I beg to differ. I've done it all my life. And I've known lots of people who have done it. But even more on the other side, I get people who push at me and say, 50%, what's wrong with you? You should be doing 60, 70, 80%, right? So, you know, your savings rate is, again, a very personal thing. But don't ever say that 50% or any given can't be done because people are not only doing that, but considerably more. Whether you do it or not is is up to you. And that's really a function of how quickly do you want to become fully FI? The more quickly you want to do it, then the higher your savings rate. And there's actually a chart in the book that will roughly show based on an assumption of an 8% return. Okay, if your savings rate's 20%, it's going to take this long. If your savings rate is 80%, it's going to take this long. And obviously, that's a much shorter period of time. Again, it's your call. Depends on it depends on what you want in your life, right? Yeah, and it gives you options. So it's all about having options. <laughs> the question from someone else who's either the same Thomas or another Thomas. I don't know. There's many Thomas asking questions today, <laughs> or one Thomas who asks really good questions. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> how, how can I invest the best way to support my children later on? I don't really need to withdraw much when I'm retired to have a good living. Well, I'm I'm not sure what he means by support his children. I you think know, it's, he wants to invest for his kids generally, yeah, for their education or something like that, or probably education and maybe more. I'm not sure. Yeah, so I I think it's the same as investing for anything, right? So I I think what I would do if I were Thomas and what I did actually was I focused on on building my own wealth. And then as I built my own wealth, that meant that when the time came, I had the resources. And I think where you guys are, college is, is not so expensive. But here in the United States, college is a big expense. But I had the resources to help my daughter with college when the time came. I'm not a huge fan of supporting your kids much beyond that. I, I'm more a fan of... of hopefully raising your kids so they are strong, resourceful, industrious people who can go out and make their own way in the world. It's not that I don't want to give her money selfishly, but I think, you know, uh, uh, kids that have everything handed to them turn, turn out to, by and large, not have very good life experiences. At least that's my observation. But certainly supporting them through their childhood and through their education uh, I'm all in favor of, but that's just a function of making sure that you are financially strong. You know, as the saying on airplanes go, put on your mask first and then help the person next to you. Thank you so much, JL. I will stop the questions from the audience here, but what I will do is I'll invite everyone who is in the audience right now. If you want to turn on your microphone and your camera, and JL, if you find a way to, to, to put the view where you can see everyone in as a gallery, then okay. you might see a lot of faces. So everyone, please turn on your, your microphones and your, your cameras. Well, microphones, you don't have to, but camera, certainly. If you want to say hi to JL. Hi, everybody. Good opportunity. Yeah. We've got the gallery view now. Yes, and we have 70 people. So one gallery view, you will not see everyone. You can slide to the right and you'll see the rest of the people in the corner. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Wow. 
we, we get to almost the same number of, of people who as the number of stories in your book, but not quite. <laughs> <laughs> and these are all people who are also on the simple path, inspired by, you know, your experience, your writings, your teaching and your wisdom. And we all, you know, very grateful and thankful that we can learn from, from what you've gone through, because you've gone through a lot. And we get, you know, we, we are lucky that we don't necessarily have to go through all of that. <laughs> we can take the shortcuts and direct he get on the short path and on the simple path sorry and that's quite amazing so on behalf of the whole community i'd like to thank you Jill, for all the work you do and for the, the community you've built and for all of this and uh, i invite everyone to join me in, in thanking him if if you want to turn on your mics uh, this is a amazing opportunity to say thank you to to jim person you're very kind it's an honor to have the conversation with you i see a lot of people but thank you Jill. <laughs> thank you thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. Always a pleasure to listen to your stories and your wisdom. <laughs> You're very kind. Thank you. And if anybody has a, a spontaneous question, now is also a good time. I'm not going to go through the rest of the question that we're on slides. Yes, I have if, one, if it's possible. Yes, yes, please go ahead and go ahead. So from what I understood, let's say you have a portfolio of investment, um, financial assets, that is. And so basically you withdraw 4% every year, right? To live off of those investments, right? That Well, that's what's known as the 4% rule. I think of it more as a guideline, but okay. basic research has indicated that if you can pull 4% from a portfolio uh -huh. and have a high likelihood that it will last for, for decades. Okay, so here's my question. Let's say you are uh, already FI, so you're living every year on the 4% of your financial assets. I mean, by, by withdrawing 4%. But let's say there's a bear market. So now if you withdraw 4%, it's not the same value, right? Right. So now you get to adjust your lifestyle. So my question is, how do you make sure you're able to be FI at the same uh, amount of money all the time? So first of all, the Trinity study which looked into this idea of withdrawal rates and it looked at a lot of different withdrawal rates and a lot of different portfolios based on you know the allocation from 100 percent stocks to 100 percent bonds this by the way is where where i got the idea that you don't want to let your your allocation go below 50 percent stocks okay. because when you look at that that research when it drops below 50 50 percent then things stop stop working very well okay but uh anyway that when you looked at all those those uh variables that that they came up with that's where this four percent rule came from and they they said you know if we look at at i think it was 50 for 50 50 bonds and stocks and we withdraw four percent and we adjust for inflation every year okay. there's a six percent chance it will last 30 years that's even withdrawing during bear markets so okay. that is assuming that you just keep withdrawing that four percent even when the market is down okay, okay, okay. like it's not like in a perfect situation it's it's like in the doesn't have to be a perfect situation and that's why four percent of the time it in fact fails because there are times when especially if you run into a bear market early it's this is what's called sequence of return risk mm -hmm. if you run into a especially an extended bear market at the very beginning of your retirement then your portfolio is less likely to recover from those mm -hmm. withdrawals now having said all of that i think it is absolutely insane to withdraw four percent a year set it on autopilot and never think about it right and I think it's insane for two reasons. One is it's possible if you do that, that you'll be in that in that small minority where it fails and you don't want to wind up broke. So I would certainly, if there was a bear market, I would think about reducing the, the amount I was withdrawing. Okay. Right? Just a safer thing to do, live on less. Just like if you went to your job tomorrow and your boss said, gee, we love you, but times are tough and we're going to cut your salary by 20%. Well, you probably wouldn't go on spending the same amount of money that you had before. But the other reason that I don't think you should set it on autopilot and forget about it, and this is more positive, that in most scenarios in the Trinity study, 
not only can you withdraw that 4% and expect your money to last, your money grows to incredibly large proportions at the end of 30 years. And so just like you just like you don't want to not pay attention and run out of money, you also, if you don't pay enough attention, you might miss the opportunity to spend much more money because your money that you're not withdrawing has grown so dramatically. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah, I, I didn't realize it was taking into account the the bear market situation. I thought it was like you absolutely. Know, you don't know the noise. Yeah, I don't think that was for the call here. It's just someone. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Sorry, Anger, and I think you're on mute now. Yeah, someone someone was speaking with the microphone on, but okay, carry so on. Get, carry on, Anger. JL for answering the question. Can I ask another one? Or... That's up to our moderator. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, one more, and then and then we we have very simple one. I I I wrote I wrote it down in the in the writing section. It's for Sebastian. How many? Like you said, you did it in seven years. So how much money were you putting in the stock market every month to be able to do it in seven years? So that's a question for you, Sebastian. That's yeah, a question that's... for me. Yes, I was investing a lot. Okay. I look. I don't think this is the right place to go into all the details about my story. There's an entire podcast episode on that. That's I don't cool. share the specific numbers, but I can tell you I was investing a lot. Yes, because yeah. I was working abroad. It was two of us, no kids at that point. Okay. Uh, climbing the career ladder and living very, very frugally, happy with simple things where most people around me were spending on all sorts of useless stuff. Okay. And then good yeah. market, good stock market as well. So it's a combination of many things. So it's not repeatable easily, certainly. But the high salary helped, yes. Okay. Episode five in the Fire Belgium show, you can get a lot of details. Cool. I will check this out. Thank you very much. That's uh, that's all for me. Thank you both. For, to you both. Any other questions? We have a few more minutes. Anyone else? This is your one chance. Who knows? <laughs> I have a question, maybe. Yes, yes, please go ahead. Yes. So I saw the Excel that you shared in one of the other uh, presentations where you could put in your own numbers. Like oh, that's me, the, yeah? Any question for me? No, no, in general. So, like okay. I, I did the calculation, like what amount of money I would need to be FI, FI. And I realized that I would never be able to get there based on the money that, that I could put away right now. So what do you do in that case? Is this a question for me or for jail? Both. You want to you want to take it, Sebastian, or you want me? <laughs> yeah. Look, the tool that I designed there is for people to realize the power of compounding, and also to realize the power of if I spend a hundred euro less, and so I can invest a hundred euro more, and I don't have the same expense long term. What difference can that make? Now, of course, it's you know what you, the numbers you've put in there are the numbers of today, right? The current situation, which may not be easy you may have debts or you may have high expenses or low income but it's the current it's the current picture it's, that's what reality is today right and it's reality that's not completely accurate because it doesn't take into account social security and pensions right so that's not in the calculator which you know you probably are entitled to and it's not in there so you, you know take it with a grain of salt and it's a linear model it's a linear model in the sense that it just says it assumes a sort of percentage return from stock market long term. So there's a lot of variability, but certainly it gives you an idea of where you are today. And so either, you know, people who use the simple financial independence calculator, they'll be like, oh, I'm actually quite I'm actually quite far already on the journey, or I've got work to do. And that's kind of the main thing you get out of those because it doesn't, it's not perfect science, right? And if you've got work to do, then there's work to do, right? That means see if you, there's ways you can improve, increase your your your, your income. See if there's ways you can reduce your expenses. And yeah, often that takes work. And then you improve the numbers. And that can change, you know, quite fast if you decide to, you know, if you, if you're up for the challenge, things can change quite fast. And the stories in this book show that a lot of people starting from very difficult situations actually make it happen. And it takes years in case, in some cases, but the changes happen faster than what this tool shows. Because this tool shows what would happen if you don't do anything. And only invest what you currently have. But if you work on the other aspects of things, whether it's just your career, a side gig, reduce expenses, move to a different place, downsize, change cars, different things, right? Whatever your imagination can do, 
then that's going to change very fast. And the numbers in the tool will change fast too. That's happened to me, right? So my personal experience with my projections was my first projections, I was planning to retire at 65. I didn't know about five. Then when I put, I increased the number of the amount of savings, then I was retiring at 55. And for a long time, there was just 55. And then gradually as things improved and I realized the power of investing, I was motivated to save more because I was spending on the most luxurious thing I could spend on, which is something I'm stealing from Jill's book. I was spending on buying freedom. And so it gave me motivation to save more and invest more as an expense, but on the most important thing for me, which was freedom. And once you, once you get all of these things moving in your life, you know, you'll make changes. Yeah. You'll make changes. You, you, you know, you can make, you can make improvements. So don't look at this as like, it's game over for me. No, this is just where you are today. But there's people in far worse situations who just make progress and change that. And I think you can do that too. Yeah, what you what you're really talking about is lifestyle inflation. So you've created a certain life, and it sounds like you're spending most of the money that's coming your way to support that life. And there's a whole section in Pathfinders titled Lifestyle Inflation about people who face that challenge and have to you simply have to unwind the life that you've created and make your investing and buying your freedom more important to you. And that's a decision you have to make and how exactly you do it are decisions you have to make. And the book will probably provide some inspiration for that, but it's, it's a difficult thing. There's no question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thanks a lot for the advice. It made me realize that I still have uh, some work to do and probably some decisions to make. Um, yeah, because some of the, the costs are fixed. Uh, like uh, I have two kids to support and some of the, the money goes to them. But yeah, there's probably other things and more inspiration to grow the income or save more wisely, I would say. But it's not game over, so that's good news. <laughs> it's just a start. You just started on the simple path, right? You're at step one. You're discovering. You're looking at the numbers and you're like, that's where I am. That's where we all started. That's where JL started. That's where I started, right? And it could be that in a few years, you're the one sharing your story of how you've done all of these changes and you got to fire in so many years or whatever it is. Or it might take a bit longer, but that's okay. You know, take it easy, enjoy life like JL did and you know, find the path that works for you. Take it easy. Thanks. Good luck. And we're all here to help you. So you Thanks know, if, a lot. The, if, if you're in the Fire Belgium Facebook group, feel free to ask questions. The books here are gems. Like, you know, these will help you a lot. Um, so get Jill's books. Any, has anyone else? Has CL plans to visit Belgium in the future? Oh, I, I would love to. I, I don't, and I have been there as we talked about earlier i think what do we agree sebastian i think it was 2019 and the first meetup like this we did was in person i would love to get back i had a great time in belgium but i don't have any immediate plans but let us okay. know when that happens <laughs> oh, I, <Okay>. absolutely <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be the first to know awesome thank you so much okay any last questions all right well Thank you so much, Jill, for your time again and for all the work you do and your inspiration. You know, I owe a lot to you and your work. And I think a lot of the community benefits from that fact as well, from your work directly, but also from what I share from you. So thank you for that. And everyone who's attended today, I hope you enjoyed the conversation and the call. And I invite you to actually get Jill's books, both of them. I think Pathfinder is probably good if you're trying to share the stories of financial independence with someone. And once someone is convinced that that's the way forward, then the simple path is a solution because that's the how-to. Obviously, the technical aspects of how to do it in Belgium, we talk about that in the community of Fire Belgium, but there you'll have all of the knowledge and the philosophy, the strategy for it. So just go grab them. Thank you, everyone. Take care and uh, good night. See you next time. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs> <laughs>